Hello, and welcome to a guide to getting started in open source. My name is Abigail McCarthy, and I'm a senior open source technical communication manager at VMware. So some more about me. I've been working for the past few years um, in open source and, and documentation in open source. And uh, currently I work as the uh, documentation lead for the Harbor and Valera open source projects. And both of those projects are in uh, you know, the, the cloud native container space. So that it, just to give you an idea of the types of different projects and technologies I work on. Um, and the reason why I wanted to put together this presentation is because I, I remember what it was like when I was getting first in, first getting involved in open source. So I, I had been previously working uh, as a technical writer uh, on different commercial softwares. So when I got the opportunity to work in open source, I was really excited, but it was also really kind of overwhelming. There was a lot of new terms, a lot of new technologies, and a lot of new styles of doing things that I, I kind of had to take some time to adjust um, and figure out the best way to go forward. So uh, I wanted to put together this talk uh, to, to give you an overview of what open source is, what are the benefits that you can get out of contributing to open source, and then also give some tips of things that I have learned about how to get started on your own journey in open source. So to begin with, open source is a software designed to be completely publicly accessible in every way. So it's free to download, free to use, and it's uh, free for anyone to, free and available for people to go in and make changes to. So the code base is completely online and it's all accessible. The common structure of an open source project is first and foremost uh, volunteer driven. So what, like for example, there are, there are opportunities uh, to work full time as a contributor to open source, that, that's my job role. I'm paid, you know, thankfully paid <laughs> to be able to contribute to open source. But the vast majority of projects are supported um, through volunteer efforts. So that's something that to, to remember as, as you go through. And that also leads to uh, the second bullet here, which is community. So folks um, who are interested in, community describes uh, folks who are interested in the project, but it also describes the sort of mindset about uh, open source in general. So it's, uh, it's community in the sense that anyone can be involved and anyone can have a say because everyone has ownership. There isn't a particular company that owns the project. It's, it's really everyone who is involved with the project has the ownership to make changes and be involved. The next sort of thing um, level to the structure is a contributor, which is somebody who more actively participates in the project. Uh, so it'd be somebody you know, contributing code, contributing documentation, working on support issues, and involved in conversations around um, the project future and, and features uh, that are being worked on within the project. And then the next level above that will be a, a maintainer. So this is someone who's a project leader. You know, they have uh, the permissions to, to approve co code changes, um, merge, co merge code changes, um, really sort of just the project leader. And these are really great people to know. So, you know, when you get first get involved in a project, it's really good to, to know who the maintainers are because these would be the people who would have the most information uh, if you have questions and the, the best people to ask uh, on, on how to get started. A key thing here is that open source projects are always looking, always looking for documentation help. So a lot of play, a lot of projects, um, they might not have ever had a top person fully dedicated to documentation. They might have been written, written the docs themselves. Uh, so they might be written by developers. So um, I would I would say that they will most projects would be very much excited to have someone come and help them offer to help with their documentation. It's been my personal experience with every project I've worked on. Uh, people are very much excited to have somebody to help with docs because they know that it is an important part of the project and important to the project uh, long term uh, sustainability. And there are there are a ton of benefits to working in open source. Um, I have a few listed here, and there's a th but there are more. Um, the first one uh, is really building out a portfolio, especially if you are a new technical writer or looking looking to get your first job in technical writing. A lot of places when you apply for a te technical writing job, they will ask for writing samples. So working through open source, you're able to build out your portfolio. Um, so you, when you go to apply, you you have those links and you have that, that those samples to provide. The next bullet uh, is learning new skills. 
Uh, so if you're working in a position or you're trying to get transition into a different area of technical writing, you can use open source to, to learn those new skills that you would need, um, make it part of your portfolio, like I was mentioning, and then go to apply to transition. So like if you wanted to get more involved in API documentation, but your current role doesn't have the opportunity to do that, you can work in an open source setting on API docs, you know, and then and use that to sort of transition into a career doing that. Um, the second, the, the last bullet here uh, is uh, growing your network. And this was a really um, pleasant surprise <laughs> for me, I guess you could say, when I got involved in open source, because I had previously, or most often work on a team as a, not really a team, as a lone technical writer. We're on a very small team of writers fo but focused on different areas. So when I got out working in open source, um, it was a really great chance to work with other writers and to learn from people who had more experience writing, um, doing technical writing. I could learn more about the processes and different tools and, and just really how, how, how to do technical writing in a more of a team setting, which is not something that I was able to do, you know, just as a lone writer. It was really awesome to, the first time I got to, to work with other writers. And the other piece of growing your network, um, Again, like if you if you were looking for a new job, being able to have um, a broader network of people that you have met through open source that you can use as references um, what, to apply for a new job, um, really, really, really important piece of of looking for looking for looking for new jobs. Um, I would I would say personally, I don't I think at least the past two or three jobs that I've had ha I have gotten through referrals of people that I met in open source. So it, it's, it was really important, um, really important to me to be able to grow the network through open source. And the fourth bullet here, um, which kind of all the other bullets have kind of connected into, uh, but it, it really can pro provide you with an opportunity uh, for career growth. If you're in a, not in a position that you're in your current job, you're not where you want to be, you can use open source to sort of build out those skills, build your portfolio, and help leverage that into a position in a new position or as you know come come back to your, your current position and say look I I, have, I I can grow my career because I have I have these experiences so there there are really a lot of important benefits to working in open source and I would say the the really important thing to do is to know what you want to get out of the experience so open source is very vast and there's lots of different type of projects and opportunities that you can find working there. Um, but I, I think it's really important to know what you wanna get out of the experience because that will really help you hone in on the types of projects and the types of contributions that you can make that will, that will feed back into the experience, especially if you aren't able to get time um, from your employer to contribute and you're doing it on nights and weekends or around your normal schedule. Um, if you don't feel like you're getting anything out of it, it will probably it will be harder for you to sustain contributing long term versus if, if you know what you want to get out of it and you really you really are engaged with those contributed contributions and it connects back into whatever your goals are. So the next step would be to just find a project to work on. Get out there and start doing your research. And as I mentioned, open source is a vast and, and wondrous land. So there are projects out there that meet, that match whatever you're interested in working on. Um, you just have to go out and find them. I'd also, uh, you know, you can go out and just Google for them, you know, or you can uh, uh, also talk to people you know in open source or some colleagues if they have any recommendations on projects that, that they've had a good experience in or things that they recommend um, as, 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 that you could work on. But the second bullet here, I think is really important uh, to consider because it is a work setting that you're getting in when you get involved in open source. So in the same way that you would want to make sure the company that you work for or you're applying to is a good culture fit uh, for you and your style of work, you should do, be doing the same thing um, as you get involved in open source. Make sure that the, the way the project is working and what the project is working on really fits in with, with your values and how you want to be working on how you want to work. So the last bullet is for utilizing company policies or manager support, um, which like I mentioned, I've been very fortunate to work at companies where 
the we're contributing to open source was really um, part of the company goals and part of company policy. So it was a lot easier to get managerial, you know, my manager support to make those make those contributions and transition into open source. But I do understand that not that's not the case for every company and not the case for every person here listening. Um, and there's there's a lot of nuances that can go into this um, depending on your situation. And I know it can be really tough, um, you know. To, Depending on, on depending on your situation, it can be really tough to, to get the time. But I would recommend um, at least taking taking a deeper look at uh, company policies you might be able to use. Maybe your company has a rotation uh, policy that you can transition onto another team that is contributing to open source, or maybe they have some um, personal development time um, that is built into some career journey. Whatever it is, you can work with your manager um, and, and get support that way, so you don't have to spend time. Outside of work, you can try to find time to work um, on open source during your daily, your, your day to day work life. And some more things to look for in your research of a project. So you can really see, um, so it's, a, it's just a screenshot from GitHub. You can see the recent contributions um, or activity that's going on within a project. So you can see how how um, how frequently the files are updated. When's the last time someone made a, a a change to the code base? You can also look at different issues and see if, if people are responding to questions um, within you know a reasonable amount of time. Depend, and you can get a kind of a sense of how active the community is, how active the maintainers are, um, and if it's something that uh, you'll be able to get help uh, quickly on. If if you're looking to get into a project, you know if it's if it's a small uh, group of people, small community, small maintainer base. It might be harder to get some time um, because people, they just might not be there uh, to answer your questions. You also don't want to get uh, too involved in a project that has been abandoned if there's no longer making, no one's actively maintaining it. Um, you'll, you want to look for something that's, that's pretty being actively engaged with, with the community so you can get that support uh, and, and make contributions to projects that people will be using. The next bullet, uh, which is how another way you can get engagement and also, like I was mentioning, that culture fit before, you can kind of sit in on if they have meetings or you can look at Slack or if they have a mailing list, you can get um, a better sense of uh, how the community interacts with each other, how, how the maintainers are, if they're responsive um, to questions in Slack. Uh, and you can also use that as a way to hear about new uh, projects that are going on and if, if the if, if the direction of the project, um, if the direction, if the direction the project is taking, there we go. If the direction the project is taking is something that you'll be interested in in getting involved in. Um, some more things to look for. Um, again, with the culture fit, the project might have a code of conduct that you'd be able to see um, what the expectations are for the community members and how they're expected to to behave within the community, and then. Projects might also have contributing guides um, that sort of outlines how to get involved, uh, what tools are being used, how to get them set up, um, which is obviously very helpful for new people. Not all projects will have these, but if they do have them, it's really great to, to, to take a look at them um, and see if it's something that you'll be interested um, in working on. Again, like I was just saying, uh, not all projects are set up to handle new or inexperienced contributors, which doesn't mean that the project isn't worth contributing to. It just might mean that you might have more of an investment on your end to make in order to get started working on that project. Um, especially if, uh, you know, if there isn't a big community or a lot of maintainers, they might not have been able, you know, they just might have not have had time to write this up or they might expect um, people contributing to have a certain level of knowledge about the technology. Um, so that's something that to look to look out for um, as you're picking your project that you want to work on. It's also another area that you can contribute. You know, like I said, it might they might not have had time or had thought about the new contributor experience within that project. So that's something that you you can if you want to continue to work on that project, you can put together that that material you know, as a way to help you learn how to contribute to the project and also help other contributors um, as they get involved as well. So the next thing to think about is tools. 
Um, and there, there, you know, might be some specific ones, uh, specific to the project you want to work on, but in general, open source projects use source control, uh, particularly Git, I would recommend as something to look into. Most projects are on GitHub. So if you don't have an account, you should definitely sign up for one and sort of play around and, and understand how that works. Um, but also focus, focus on, um, do, if you're not familiar with Git, uh, taking a tutorial, um, and get an understanding of some of the basic commands uh, and, and some of the basic of, of how, how source control works in general, if you're not used to it. Um, really valuable to learn that uh, because it is very widely used in open source. Um, the next would be uh, text editors. So I personally use Atom, uh, but it's really whatever tool or whatever editor you feel comfortable with. Um, but this is how you would be primarily making changes um, to the content. Um, so you'll, you'll need to have one to be able to interact with the project. Uh, the next thing on the list uh, will be Markdown, which is a markup language for uh, plain text. So it's, I have a, a screenshot here. Um, and then you can see it's very straightforward um, and pretty easy to adopt. And it's very widely used within open source projects. Um, so if you're not familiar, I would really recommend um, taking a look. But you can see on the, the left side here, just some, some um, basic markup that's been applied to the text. And then you can see how it would be rendered um, on the right hand side here. This is also something, this is a screenshot from my text editor, which, which has a, a, a markdown renderer built into it. So as I make changes to the to content, I can see what how it would look, make sure it formats correctly in real time. So that's something I would also recommend um, as you're choosing a text editor, make sure to have one that has an extension um, for, for rendering markdown. The last item on the list is static site generators, which are lightweight ways of um, building websites. So the static, it, a static site generator could take a project's markdown, run it through a, um, a you know, template renderer, and then produce a, the static HTML that the open source project could use to host their web, you know, use for their website. And I wanted to put them in here. Not all open source projects have websites, which is fine. They will probably just use GitHub um, file, you know, files within GitHub within the repo um, for their documentation, which is fine. But a lot of projects also do use static site generators. Um, like I said, they're they're pretty lightweight to to use and maintain. They're also pretty pretty. They're also um, themselves open source projects. So they're free, they would be free to use. Um, but they're also another area to contribute to if you, um, if you are look, if you are interested in that area, you can contribute um, to some of these projects. Um, and the reason why I wanted to include them is because as you are making contributions to content, you might have to consider how the content will be rendered on the project's website. Um, which would mean that you might need to know a little bit about the static site generator that they're used. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that it was included so you'd be aware of them in case they come up down the road. Now for all of these tools, do not worry about being an expert. It's definitely not required uh, for you to get involved. You do not have to have an expert level understanding of these tools, but it is good to get a, a, a sort of a basic understanding um, of the commands, generally what uh, common terms are within those tools so that as you go through any onboarding guide or you're working with the maintainers, you have you have more of a reference point um, of how to get involved um, and how to get started and what tools the projects are using. So now that you have a project that you wanna work on, that you found that you wanna work on and you have your reasons for why you wanna get involved in open source and you've also done some uh, your investigation into the different types of tools and you feel like you're ready to make a contribution, you know, where to start? So I'd recommend um, reading through the documentation of the project that you wanna work on. Um, you know, it's a great place to start to learn about the project. And then you can also, you know, see if you find, you know, either a typo or broken link or, or something or, or a section of the documentation you think could be explained better. Um, these are great ways to, to find um, something to be your first contribution. You can also um, review the open issues in GitHub and see if they have anything documentation related um, that you might wanna work on. Um, I have some examples here of GitHub labels that a project might use um, 
these are um, it's a good first issue or help wanted, which are um, applied by maintainers to let people in the community know that you know something is a good first issue for a first time contribution contributor, or that they are looking for help from the community on that particular issue. That, depending on the project, the, the words might be a little different. The labels might not be the same. Um, they might just have a generic uh, documentation label, which is fine. Um, just wanted to give you an idea of, of some things to look for, uh, to hone in on some issues that might be a good place to start. Uh, the next item is to join in on uh, project meetings in Slack and just introduce yourself. Say, hello, I'm here. I'm looking for something to contribute. Does anyone have any ideas of where I can get started? Um, and that hopefully is a good way for you to meet the maintainers and then for them to meet you. And then you guys uh, all can get together um, and, and figure out where you can get started um, if they have some projects that they might need help on um, or they might have some ideas of where to look <clears throat> within the project itself to get ideas. Also, do not be afraid to ask for help. Uh, with, that's what the community is there for, to help you. Um, so if you're running into trouble finding something to work on or if you're having trouble getting set up, uh, with any of the tools being used by the project, uh, make sure to reach out and ask for help. Don't let that be a blocker to making your first contribution. Now, some things to think about um, as you get started in your first contribution and then you know, thinking about continuing that uh, be, to be involved in open source. Um, initially, I would recommend starting small, um, particularly if you're very new uh, to a lot of the tools or you um, are just new to the technology. I'd say recommend, I'd recommend to start small, you know, get get yourself to a place to get that easy win um, and make sure that you have your thing, your tools um, set up correctly um, to continue making those contributions. The next thing I have uh, is to be honest with your time commitment. So I would uh, be the first to raise my hand and say that I, I fall into this all the time where I tend to uh, over over commit to things. But I think it's really important um, to be honest. Um, with honest with yourself initially of how much time you will actually spend contributing to open source particularly if it's something you're doing outside of work hours because everyone you know everyone has a life and you should be living it um so make sure that you're honest with how much time you're able to contribute and then also be honest as you work in the community with how much time you really have to work on things because you know like i said a lot of a, a, pretty much everyone working in open source is there as a volunteer anyway. So they understand that you're there for, for you're only there on a volunteer basis um, and that you have other responsibilities because they have other responsibilities as well. So I would just make sure that you're very um, upfront about your time commitment and, and set it at a level that you'll be able to sustain um, going forward. Like at, at, as you continue contributing, be some be committed to a time that you'll, you'll able be able to do consistently. The last bullet here is also just to remind you that you're not married, you know, you're not married to the first project you find and contribute to. You can try more than one. Um, if something isn't working out or isn't what you expected, you know, it's okay to move on to a different project. You know, be be truthful with the, the kind of things that you want to work on um, and, and make sure that what you're working on is uh, feeding back into that uh, experience that you wanted to get out of open source that we talked about earlier. So definitely feel like it's okay to move on and try different projects if you need to. I think the most important thing to, to getting started in open source is to just do it. I know for me, I spent uh, an embarrassingly long amount of time <laughs> in the research phase where I was just researching like a bunch of like projects or like even just one project, I just like read their docs like all the time. And I never got past that point because I was I was really afraid of making a mistake um, or, or being like pick, doing something that wasn't valuable. And that really held me back from, from being engaged in the community and, and making those contributions. So I would advise not to be me and just to get out there and start doing it because um, people are, are way more excited that you're there to help with the documentation and to see you making contributions to the documentation. They'll be way more excited about the fact that you're there to help than they will care about something being done a little bit incorrectly or some minor changes or whatever, whatever it is. 
So definitely take, definitely don't be me and um, just get out there and do it. And everyone is there um, for the betterment of the project. So if you're there and you're trying to do your best, people will be really receptive of that and be really, be really welcoming and, and be thankful. Be thankful that you're there, particularly helping out with the documentation. So I hope that this was helpful and you got some valuable tips on how you're getting started, how you can get started in your own journey into open source. Thank you for listening and I hope you have a great day. Okay, so people are streaming in. Um, I saw that somebody in the main stage chat was wondering what your Twitter handle was. Yes, so I used Twitter, so um, it would be not, I don't have a handle, which I know I, I am probably uh, <laughs> in the minority there, but uh, I don't either. yeah, okay, <laughs> I don't have one. So, um, but I am on the Write the Doc Slack. If you have any questions, um, please reach, feel free to reach out there. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, well, well, people are coming in. I just wanted to say thanks for that talk. I mean, like I was saying earlier, we get questions about getting started in open source all the time. And I think it was awesome that you made this talk accessible for everybody um, at any level. Um, and you made it sound so doable, which is awesome because I think especially when you're getting started, it can seem really scary, so. Yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was definitely my biggest hurdle. Um, and getting started, it was yeah. sort of uh, feeling like I could could do it, and and that's that's something I I, I got across that you know it's it's open for everyone, um, which is why it's open source. So um, making sure it was it oh, something that everyone would be able to to get involved in. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, so there was also lots of interest in your banana bread in the chat, and probably maybe because I made a big deal. <laughs> um, <laughs> we get started really, really quickly because there are some awesome uh, questions in the spreadsheet. But do you have any tips, or is it all like a trade secret? Uh, there are no secrets, and also like not a lot of like great successes. Um, I I have always like I don't know what it was about quarantine i feel like i just like saw people were making like banana bread so i was like i'm gonna do that and i'm gonna make the perfect recipe and i i kind of haven't really found it yet um but uh i found a couple of recipes that i liked but there hasn't been i for some reason i have like the, the vision of the perfect banana bread in my head and i have it i also like to experiment a lot with different recipes and like my own twist which usually means that everything turns out like terrible so <laughs> well that was my goal for quarantine to be like, I'm going to make the greatest banana bread. And it's I'm sort of still questing after it. So I appreciate all the tips and, and links to, to um, recipes that people. We love the quest for a white whale. Um, I love that yours is <laughs> banana bread. And we look forward to um, updates in Slack. <laughs> Um, yeah, for sure. So yeah, we had a question from Robert towards the beginning of your talk, and I think you addressed it, um, but it might be interesting maybe to get your personal perspective on it. He was asking about whether most of your or open source work um, is done in your own time, or does your real employer give you time? And how much support do you get from your employer? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so currently, I'm 100% my job is to participate projects and, and be writing content there. Um, so that's mm -hmm. my, my whole team is dedicated to working on open source projects. So it's all very supportive, very, um, you know, advocating to get out there in, in different projects. Um, but I initially, um, it was more like a side hustle, part of my job where I was dedicated for, uh, I was dedicated to writing product documentation. Um, and then they were like, oh, also on the side, open source. So I definitely understand that it's kind of hard to carve out that time because that's how I started in open source is like carving out like an hour or two a week to just sort of get um, get into different projects and sort of start learning, um, trying to make that first commit. Um, and then I sort of slowly got onto more teams where it was becoming a bigger and bigger piece of my job. Um, and now it's the full part. So uh, it's been a, a couple of years to get to that, but uh, so I kind of have that's so cool. And I love that you explained the whole the whole progression, because I think a lot of people go, well, what is next? And so it's cool that you um, that you can kind of lay that out for what it looks like for you. Um, we have a question from Jesse, and I love how much discussion came of this question. But she says, I'm new to technical writing. What skills would I need before trying to contribute to open source? 
Yeah, so um, I saw that question in the chat and there was a lot of really great um, helpful answers. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest hurdle, if you're not familiar with a, a source, source control, that's probably the biggest thing um, to pick up. Um, Git can be really complicated, uh, but just focusing on um, the, uh, like a very basic tutorial, um, the basics down, and then also um, uh, using things like GitHub and GitLab. I know somebody mentioned in the chat. I, I didn't include it in the presentation, but that's definitely gr a great place that has open. Um, uh, but both of those things, they also have um, UI interfaces. Um, so you can just go through that to make your contributions. You don't necessarily need to know all of the nitty gritty of the command line if you wanna just sort of get started in that way of just sort of working through the UI. I, I still do that sometimes. It's just easier sometimes to just go through the UI. Um, instead of remembering what all the commands are for. Um, so that's sort of um, definitely the biggest, uh, if you're not used, biggest learning curve there. Um, but there's a lot of other tools. Um, I, I mentioned them, uh, making sure you have a code editor, um, being a little familiar with Markdown, um, and just those ones I mentioned. I think those are the, I'm trying to remember what they are. But I think that uh, the biggest hurdle, I think, might be just learning Git, um, but the other ones, um, should be pretty pretty straightforward, hopefully. And there's a lot of really great information out there, which I know people have, have been sharing. Yeah, that's awesome. I appreciate having your take on it too. Um, I think this is a really awesome question for Nathaniel. How do you handle reaching out to SMEs in an open source project? Um, SMEs are subject matter experts, if anybody is um, drowning in lingo. If I'm at work, for example, I can just walk down the hall and ask, but how can I learn technical details in a project needed to start creating docs? That's um, a really excellent question. Um, and I would say for that, I mean, in, in general, people might be to respond just because they are, might be a volunteer or might whatever. So it might be harder to find someone or, or even the original person who started working on something because they might have moved on for the project. So I can definitely um, I'd say the best place to start is to work um, through the people in the community and particularly the maintainers of the project. And there'd be issues if, you find, if you're working on um, a particular area and you're not sure how it works, maybe find um, some issues that people have been engaging with in, in GitHub and sort of find some names and sort of reach out to them. Um, it's sort of a little story -ness that you need to take on uh, to do that. Um, but ho hopefully it's something that the maintainers of the project will be at least able to help narrow you down if they are not the SMEs themselves, point you in the right direction there. Um, and then also you can reach out on the Slack channels or um, um, in whatever communication channels they have to say, I want to help on this thing. Do you know who, 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 who knows about this information? Um, it'd probably be where I would start. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Isaiah. I've never done open source. Is there an easy way to identify the skill level res uh, required for a project? Do project owners or maintainers do a decent job at listing skill requirements? Or is it something you figure out on the fly? Um, another really great question. I think a lot of that kind of depends on the project. Um, I, would, I would say to find something that maybe is a bigger project that has a lot of um, community engagement and a lot of people contributing to it because they're more likely to have, have build those resources but they, because they would have more people who go through the process. So at some point they would have hopefully documented it. Um, if you find something that you wanna work on that's a little bit um, smaller, you know, maybe there's only people who work on that project, uh, they might not have that information that's readily, readily available. So you might have to then go about it. You're finding out yourself what the kind of skill level would be um, and there's also a bunch of different um, projects for different, even different technical levels. Like I work on, um, you know, cloud native projects. So working with containers and, and that sort of area. But if you want to focus on something that's more just, there's the communities right now for just technical writing. So like the Good Docs project, they had a whole uh, session yesterday on the writing day. Um, you need to just know more information about technical writing, but you wouldn't necessarily need to have knowledge there to help contribute. So there, there are different levels of projects out there that are not strictly technical or um, whatever they, they in that, those areas. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, it's a whole wild, wide world out there. <laughs> um, 
A question from Wendy is, um, how did you find a good project to work on? And I know you touched on this um, in the talk, but maybe we're looking for some some of your experience because you're here. Like projects or was that the question? Yeah, look, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so some of that was more dictated by where the product, the company that I was working on, they wanted people who were working in, in Kubernetes. And that's sort of how I got involved in, in open source. That was the first project I ever contributed to. Um, so some of that might be the way uh, you get sort of uh, told or <laughs> uh, uh, recommended to work on projects or if it's part of the product that you work on right now or something that you're just interested in, you can find open source projects that way. Um, but yeah, that's sort of how I got started. Um, but like I said, there's projects out there for for a lot of different, um, so just like going out there and trying, trying to Google for might be a good place to at least start. Uh, hopefully that works. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. So we've got time for one last question, and this is from Jerome. How often do you follow up on the work that you've done with the organization? And what approach do you find best fits how you contribute? That is an excellent question. Um, yeah, so many good questions here. That's like a question. So I um, am a lot of the projects I work on um, are a little bigger um, or you know, following up with them, part of you know my job, and then also um, a lot of places will have like community meetings. Like I know, like I said, I work with the Kubernetes um, project. They have uh, a documentation weekly meetings. They have um, a, a very active Slack channel, and that's how you can kind of touch base with people. Um, and they also um, um, management systems. So if you do submit a change that you want to make to the, the um, the content, uh, uh, they'll 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 get back to you on that. Um, so I guess uh, I guess the answer I would I would say is is to just still try to have ties into wherever the community is communicating um, to follow up at your own pace of when you want to. Um, if it's something that you really want to get done for your portfolio, you might have a little bit higher pressure of wanting to get that done. Um, so I would just say also be respectful of of your schedule, like be be clear about what things you want to get out of it for the co contributions, but then also be respectful of other people's time. They might not be able to get back to you um, as fast as you would like, which is unfortunate, but also, you know, part of part of working in open sources, things can be a little bit slower because um, everyone is more volunteer based um, and trying to put out a lot of different fires everywhere. So um, hopefully that helps answers that question as well. Yeah, that's great. We've gotten to the end of your questions. Um, thank you so much, Abigail. I think that people are going to come back to this talk over and over because, like I said, it's such a hot topic and you just laid everything out so well. Um, so everybody who's watching, yeah, thank you. Um, that brings us to lunchtime.